Today's show is a best of 2018 show for Encore Week for the 10-Minute Teacher and is sponsored by STL and ATL at Woodward Academy in Atlanta, July 26th and 27th, 2018, where I and other education leaders will be speaking. Stay tuned at the end of the show to learn more about this affordable, world-class conference this summer in Atlanta. Student Leadership in Social Media, School Reporting, and Parent Conferencing. This is episode 311. The 10 Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. Happy Motivational Monday. Some of you are going to laugh at this. So we've got the top dog teacher talking to the cool cat teacher. So we have a top dog and a cool cat today for Motivational Monday. But we're talking with Kayla Delser about students as leaders, which is a theme, Kayla, that you have a lot. What do you mean by students as leaders? So first of all, thank you so much, Vicki, for having me. I am so excited to be here today. And a big theme that I have in my classroom is everyone's a teacher, everyone's a learner. So what that means is that my kids take a lot of ownership and leadership in my school, in my classroom. Um, they teach a lot of lessons and they lead a lot of different things in our classroom. You have several different ways that students lead. Give us one of those mm -hmm. ways. Just for one example, we have um, student-led social media accounts in our classroom. My social media is all at Top Dog Teaching, and my students are on Instagram and they are on Twitter at, at Top Dog Kids. So we have a tweeter of the day every day, and we have an Instagrammer of the day every day. And the whole reason behind having these accounts is, of course, to share our story with the world, but more importantly, to teach my students about how to appropriately behave on social media and how to use digital citizenship early on before they actually have those accounts at home with their families. So they're in charge of sharing our story every day from our classroom, sharing highlights, sharing our work, sharing our story with not only other teachers in other classrooms, but of course, teachers who follow along as well. So you pre-approve these and tell us the age of your kids and kind of how you go about the process when they say, you know, Miss Delser, I have something I want to share. Right. So if they have something that they want to share, it has to fit all of our digital citizenship rules, um, which is a curriculum that I actually developed about four years ago. And there's seven different rules. So it has to follow all of those different things. And it has to highlight something that's happening in our classroom. It has to be a celebration. Um, it has to be important. It has to be necessary. It has to be kind. So for example, sharing if a student improves on a test score or sharing what we're working on in math. And sometimes we'll also just reach out to authors or we'll reach out to other classrooms to connect in that way as well. Now you teach, you're an elementary teacher, right? Yes, ma'am. I teach third grade. Awesome. So we just want all of our listeners to understand that these yes. are younger kids. Have you ever had a problem? We have not had a problem yet. Um, every once in a while, you might have somebody follow the account who we don't know or that doesn't look like somebody that we would want the following our account. So then we might block them and have that discussion about when to block and how to block. But it has been really an important learning process for my students and their parents and for me. And I feel really great about them being equipped um, when they go out and have these accounts by themselves that they'll make the, the right choices on social media because they'll know how to do it in a positive and uplifting way instead of just teaching kids how not to use social media or what not to do or trying to scare them into not using it. Okay, so Kayla, student-led social media, that's going to scare some people, but you also have student ownership of scores. Explain that to us. Yes, I do. Actually, we have our celebration calls today. So we finished our state assessment um, last week, and then this week was all about STAR testing. And I'm not sure what kind of assessment you have in the South, but we have um, STAR tests. Some people have NWEA. Um, but what I do is at the beginning of the year, I set a goal a growth goal with all of my students. And of course we test again in December and then we test again today we tested. And so for the math scores, my kids knew what their goal was. Many of them had reached in, in January. So we had to reassess and, and reset a goal. But what happens when they finish the test is they hand in their paper to me and we look at the score together right then and there. 
And then what my students actually do is they call their mom and they call their dad and they report their scores to their moms and dads. And so they talk about where they came in and where they got to and how much growth they had. And most of the time I'm crying on the phone because I'm so proud. Um, And lots of times the parents are crying tears of joy as well, because it's just so cool for kids to really take ownership of that. And it becomes not just a test that they have to take. It becomes really a piece of evidence to show that they're ready to move on to fourth grade. And I feel that when you do that, and kids really take ownership, um, their scores are actually much higher. For example, lots of my kids scored at fourth fourth grade or fifth grade. Some of them even tapped out the test today and it said above sixth grade, which was really awesome. So when you make these calls, I guess you're doing it privately so that other kids don't hear their scores. Exactly. Yep. And so we do it when other kids are maybe at specials or maybe when they're going to recess or lunch or something like that. Of course, keeping the information private is important. But now you also do student-led parent-teacher conferences, and we will link in the show notes to some folks who have talked about this. Tell us about those. Okay, so in our classroom, instead of just having parent-teacher conferences, we actually have student-led parent-teacher conferences, which I think is an important shift um, that needs to be happening, especially in elementary classrooms. So what happens instead of me just reporting data and reporting goals, uh, my students actually sit on the other side of the table in the teacher chair, and I sit with the parents on the other side of the table. And my students just basically go through a portfolio of goals that they have, dreams that they have, things that they want to work on or improve both personally and academically. They share that with their parents. They also share their early data. So they share their early scores that they have in different tests. Um, We share our math tests with them as well. And it's just really a good time for all of us to get on the same page, to all hear the same language and all hear the same information. I think about me even growing up as a, a student. I knew I was a good student. I grew up with both of my parents being teachers. So I just kind of knew that I was never going to get away with anything in school ever. So I might as well just follow all of the rules, which I still do. And I definitely feel like whenever my mom and dad went to parent teacher conferences, even though I don't think I did anything wrong in the back of my mind, I was thinking, oh my gosh, what is my teacher going to say about me? That is so bad. Like, what did I do wrong? I was always so nervous for them to come home. And of course my teachers weren't saying bad things about me, but it was that sort of unknown that gave me anxiety. So I really just love having everybody sit around the table and just really show that student that, hey, we're all on your team and we're all here to work together to support you to reach your goals this year. And that way, everybody hears the same information and everybody leaves the conference feeling amazing. The parents are so proud. The students come dressed up to lead the conference and they feel amazing. So it's just really a win-win for everybody. What happens when you have hard issues, when you have a student who has behavior issues or is really struggling or might have a learning disability and you need to talk about that with the parents? How do you handle those sensitive issues? So we still talk about them with kids there too, especially if it's a student with learning disabilities, the IEP is there and we talk about it with the special education teacher as well. And they they go through everything together and it just gets us all on the same page. And I've definitely have kids who have behaviors going on in the classroom. And um, we talk about, are we seeing those things at home too? And sometimes it's a yes. And sometimes it's a no, it just gets us all on the same page. So if maybe the parent was having that behavior at home, I can say, so, hey, how are you not having that anymore? What's working at home so that I can try that at school? Or maybe they're having a behavior at home and I can say, oh, well, we're doing zones of regulation in our classroom. So I can give you some posters for that at home and you can try it at home. So again, even if it is a harder issue, I think it's important to just have everybody on the same page, hearing about it and talking about it and just show that student support in every way that we can. Kayla, as we finish up, would you give a motivational talk to teachers about empowering students and letting them be leaders and teachers in the classroom? Vicki, one thing I say, and I preach and preach and preach, is everyone's a teacher, everyone's a learner. And then, of course, the more power I give up in my classroom, really, truly, the more power I feel that I get back. And so being willing to turn over some of the teaching to your students, turn over some of the leadership roles, turn over your your seating charts or your um, your social media, your parent-teacher conference, turning those, those things over to your students um, is one of the best decisions you can make in your classroom because really, truly, the more power you give up, the more power um, you actually get back in your classroom. 
And I really found that to be true as well. Remarkable educators. I know right now we're making apps and we have project managers and assistant project managers and graphic designers. And I basically meet with the leaders of the teams and they're organizing things and they're in charge. And it's just incredible what happens and the growth that happens when you do have students as leaders. And Mm -hmm. um, if you don't, why not? Now's a great excuse to start. Mm -hmm. So And the other thing is, if you try it at the end of the school year, what do you have to lose? You're not committing to it for the whole year. You're just kind of trying an experiment and see how it goes and say, hey, kids, we want to try this out now to see what I'm going to do in my classroom next year. Let's see what we think of this and go ahead and try students as leaders in these ways and check out Top Dog Teaching and all of Kayla's work. She has lots of resources to help you get started. Thanks, Kayla. Thank you so much. This summer. July 26th and 27th, I will be speaking with other amazing educators like Susie Boss, Janet Zanita, and many more in Atlanta at Woodward Academy's STL and ATL conference. Priced at $295, this all-inclusive event, of course, except for hotel and travel, is an incredible opportunity to engage and learn. But sign up now at stlinatl.com and join me in Atlanta this summer. Space is limited, so you'll want to go ahead and sign up. So I'll be speaking at ISTE in Akron, Ohio, and this conference in Atlanta this summer. So I hope we can connect. Thank you for listening to the 10-Minute Teacher Podcast. You can download the show notes and see the archive at coolcatteacher.com forward slash podcast. Never stop learning.